I'm Femi OK and you're in the stream. Today, what challenges does Ramadan pose for Muslims with eating disorders? As the Holy Month begins, we'll take a look at how those who are struggling can best be supported. And I'm Malika Bilal. This time of year can be difficult for Muslims struggling with or recovering from eating disorders and related mental health issues. Millions of Muslims around the world fast for 30 days from dawn to sunset, and it's a time of spiritual discipline, contemplation, and enhanced connection to God. And the end of each day is celebrated with family and friends as the fast is broken over food. Before we go any further, we would like to give a warning to our viewers. On today's program, we will discuss eating disorders. The topic may be triggering and upsetting for some. Research shows that the prevalence of eating disorders in the Western world is higher than that of non-Western countries. But Muslim women are just as susceptible to bulimia and anorexia, regardless of their cultural background or where they grew up. This is one woman's story. Hey, my name is Adeline Hossein, and I am a Muslim Algerian writer based in Oakland, California. And last year, I wrote a personal essay for Teen Vogue called What It's Like to Have an Eating Disorder During Ramadan. And the piece was something I'd been considering writing for multiple years, but it actually wasn't until I shared the idea with another Muslim friend of mine um, that I kind of felt validated in writing it because I realized through talking with her that it was actually a far more common issue than I had realized. Um, and I think the reason I hadn't realized that was because no one else was really talking about it. And so after that conversation, I did feel the responsibility to, to write and publish this piece. And obviously Teen Vogue is an incredibly public platform. Um, but I don't think I expected it to circulate as much as it had um, following publication. And so through it being shared, um, there was kind of this anxiety of how people would perceive it. Um, but I think that, you know, I've been very fortunate in that the response has been overwhelmingly positive. Um, I think that there are definitely still people who feel that this is a conversation that's better left unspoken and unhad. Um, but my, my true belief around this is that the only way we're ever going to destigmatize mental health and mental health issues um, within our own communities is really by having these difficult conversations. Thank you, Adeline, for sharing your story with the stream with us to discuss this issue. We have Julie Lara, an activist and mental health counselor Safi Halan Farah is a writer in Minneapolis, Minnesota. In Atlanta, Georgia, Nadim Ali is an imam and licensed professional counselor. And Dr. Rania Awad is clinical assistant professor of psychiatry at Stanford University and director of the Stanford Muslim Mental Health Lab. Welcome to the stream, everyone, and happy Ramadan or Ramadan Mubarak to all of you. I want to start with a story from our community. And Uzaz here lays it out in a thread on Twitter and she says it's okay to share with the world because these are very personal things, but she's open to sharing them. So this is what Uzaz writes. I feel conflicted. As always, I welcome the arrival of our holiest month, the opportunity to grow closer to the Almighty and to renew my intentions to establish justice. But this is a month of triggers. The re-traumatizing questions about why I don't fast, the trigger of having our religiosity examined through our relationship to food, our community's failure to provide support for our siblings who can't fast, and that's not because of physical illness, but mental illness, all cause pain and isolation. Julie, I'll direct this tweet to you. Talk to us about that feeling when Ramadan comes around. What does that yeah, evoke I mean, for I you? I can absolutely relate to that. Um, I'm a newer Muslim, so I converted in about 2016. Uh, prior to that, I can empathize with that feeling when family gatherings would be extremely triggering with the focus around food, um, but I never really understood how Ramadan could be triggering, obviously, until I converted. Um, I have been in recovery since about 2010. So when I converted in 2016, it was very triggering for me. Um, and it was definitely a time when I had to uh, confront my eating disorder again, after having been in recovery for a really long time, and um, make sure that I was uh, practicing fasting and not starvation 
I can understand how many people who are observing fasting during Ramadan may feel uh, triggered to want to go into starvation mode because once you start fasting, it's easy to keep going and deprive yourself to a point of self-harm when you do have an eating disorder um, like anorexia. And then with bulimia, with the overindulgence during um, the meal times, I can imagine that that would be extremely triggering. In the Muslim communities as well, there seems to be this stigma that if you uh, have a mental health issue, that it is in part due to a weakness in your faith which I think is, you know, extremely destabilizing and debilitating for people who are potentially seeking support and seeking some sort of community. So when Muslim communities um, unintentionally turn people away, mm -hmm. potentially from the religion, um, by not uh, opening up their arms and having empathy towards people who are struggling with mental health issues okay. um, and in turn condemning them. Uh, Rania, I want to show you something. This is from a website that I found about Islam and eating disorders. Uh, look here on my laptop. I'm just going to wait till you're here so that you don't miss any parts of it. I'm just scrolling up. Young man here. Eating disorders affect Muslim men too. And this is Islam and eating, this issue here. Kind of exasperated, perhaps, by Ramadan. Can you explain the extent of what we're talking about? about? We're not just talking about bulimia, which is eating and then purging. And we're not just talking about anorexia, which is restricting calories. When we're talking about eating disorders, Rania, just can you give us a, a little definition for what we're talking about so everybody understands uh, the challenge of, of what a, a month of fasting actually means? Sure. And I first, I just want to say thank you, first of all, for having this discussion. I think part of this, the solution to everything is actually having discussions on behalf of the Stanford Muslim Mental Health Lab and the Cleo Center, thank you for having this discussion and having me on here. And uh, Ramadan Mubarak to all my fellow Muslims. To answer your question and this discussion on uh, the poster you held up of feeding disorders affect men too, we have to go back and define what exactly is happening. When you think of eating disorders, really it's more uh, the idea of restrictive and unhealthy eating behavior. Different than fasting, which Julie kind of alluded to, which is much more um, the concept of restricted eating, not so much restrictive eating. So certainly it's going to affect both men and women um, uh, alike. It's just that we see that the prevalence of eating disorders comes uh, more amongst women than men. Mm. Safi, take us back to when you were a teenager and you and your classmates and your schoolmates were all trying to be as thin as possible. Take us into that mindset. Um, I think that me and my classmates, it wasn't all of my classmates, it was more of me and my friend group. Mm. We were suffering from low self-esteem and we wanted to not necessarily be the sizes and the shapes that we were naturally born to be. So in high school, I consistently weighed about 185 pounds and I'm 5'10". That may look like obesity to some people, but the way that I wear my weight, I look back on photos and I see a not a slender person, but definitely someone who isn't overweight necessarily. And um, I didn't see that. I think I suffered from body dysmorphic disorder and I, I think that my friends did too, because we used to reinforce each other's negative self-image by doing diets together. Thank you for sharing that story. I, I wanted to share another one that we got from someone online. This is Raf, who says, I developed anorexia in 2016. When the Ramadan was coming up, my entire family had already suspected that I've lost too much weight, way too fast. I was ashamed to eat in front of others, yet forced myself to eat only in front of family to prove to them that I was indeed eating. But Raf goes on to say that Ramadan was probably the most exhausting time of my life. I had to not only battle with my mind, but also with God. It was challenging for me because I consider myself to be a pretty religious person, yet here I was going into the month of Ramadan for the wrong reasons. Nadim, talk to us about what you hear when, when I read this tweet, when you hear this story. What does that spark for you, talking about going into it for the wrong reasons and it being an exhausting time? What is it about this month that might exacerbate it for the people? Yeah, I think it's important to understand the reason for the month of Ramadan. And the reason for the month of Ramadan, it's the month of the Quran. 
And I think if we have that perspective as opposed to uh, continuously focusing on the issue of food, um, because as, as Allah says that, if, you know, as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that fasting, or peace be upon him, fasting is the only thing that's for him. You only, only you know if you're fasting or not. And so we don't need to wear signs that the monster said, I'm not fasting. Uh, and, and, but the, the thing is to recognize that a person can uh, do volunteer work, a person can uh, engage in worship, they can go to the, the yeah. Salat al-Tawawi. There's so many things that they can do as opposed to focusing on the things that they cannot do. And, and also there needs to be more education from the, the, the pulpit or the minbar, uh, that, uh, from the imams. Because, uh, again, uh, there's so much in Islam that focuses on wellness and health. Mm -hmm. And so, but we tend to focus on things that are uh, basically might contribute to triggers for people who are suffering from disorders. Rania, if somebody was going to the Quran to look to see for some guidance about what they should be doing in fasting and their health, what would you share with them? There was one quote that we found that our team looked at and thought, well, this is very appropriate. So we're going to throw that up so people can actually read that and see that. But what guidance does the Quran give you if you're not well or maybe if you do have a struggle with food and, and you're worried that uh, maybe an entire month focusing on not eating might disturb your recovery? What do you do? What does the Quran say? Absolutely. I think it's really important to understand that with every uh, religious um, uh, ruling that's there, there's also the alternatives to that. And in the alternatives is essentially a mercy too. So it's important to know that when a person is unable to fast because of any sort of acute or chronic condition that they may be dealing with, whether it's physical or mental health um, related, then there is alternatives to that and it absolutely still counts. So usually for fasting, when a person can't break, uh, when can't fast for themselves, they go ahead and help feed those who are fasting, for example, as one of the alternatives. And by and that their way, that by they're able to actually partake fully into this month of Ramadan. And like Imam Nadim said, even if they themselves are not currently fasting. Nadeem, I'm right at the top of your Twitter feed here. Um, if you have a look here at my, <laughs> my, my laptop, I can see where your mind is right now. Thank you for being prepared for the show. Here's your tweet here. Ramadan fasting and mental illness. Now, we haven't really gone deep into that. But if you are struggling with your relationship with food, then there is something that you can't see that you may be struggling with there. And, and how are you helping your fellow community and people who are struggling and coming to you, how are you helping them with, with what Ramadan fasting and mental illness is saying? You know, and, and, and not only mental illness, but we have people who may have um, diabetes or hypertension or other illnesses in which sure. would, would disallow them to fast. Yeah. And so, and they, every time Ramadan approaches, they, they have a sense of, of shame and you don't want to heap more shame on people, you know, because again, the Creator will give us, He gives us uh, basically uh, opportunities to do other things. And so one of the things that I do is to encourage people to do as much as you can do, uh, because again, as the Prophet, peace be upon him, said that he only came to improve people's character. You know, and so uh, for uh, this is my 41st Ramadan, mm. and so, uh, and I still work on my character. You know, so each year, you know, because, uh, during Ramadan, you know, you look at, okay, what do I need to work on? And also, uh, outside of Ramadan, a person needs to be working a good recovery program. They need to have a support group. They need to basically have a treatment team. Uh, if you're not working there, it's just like a person who is dealing with addiction and they're not um, going to meetings or they're not uh, having a sponsor, not working a yeah. recovery program. They call them dry drunks. You know, because and so if you're not working, you know, looking at the spiritual aspect or doing a holistic program, then what happens is you can be dry and then you're at risk for relapse into an eating disorder. Mm. I'm glad that you mentioned what it is that one needs to be working on. What can I do instead as one of the solutions, because we got a comment on YouTube live from someone who said something very similar. Elizabeth said, exceptions seem like a good solution. There are exceptions for the Christian holiday of Lent, for example. If you're unable to fast, you can honor it in other ways. And, and, and that's similar to what you were saying. But you also mentioned the idea of shame. 
and how to deal with that. We got a couple of tweets from someone who, uh, I want to read this out. This is from Brua, and she says, if you're an eating disorder survivor unable to fast this Ramadan, and Ramadan in general stresses you out, just know I love you and you got this. You don't owe anyone any explanation or anything. Do you? I think it's, this is an important topic, though, she goes on to say, because mental illness in itself is a taboo topic in our community. Survivors might feel shame and guilt from the beginning anyways, so instead of making their lives harder during this time, people should be more sensitive. Safi, I'm going to direct this one to you. Talk to us about sh that shame, what that feels like and how you fight against it. Um, that shame looks different for everyone. Um, for some people, that shame manifests itself in concealing uh, their hurt and their pain. And other people, it it's deeper than concealment. It They may not even really want to ever uh, approach the subject with anyone um, who could possibly help them. And I think that for me, um, what I noticed, especially in my friend group, um, was that uh, there's already so much shame in not being able to, if you're not able to fast for uh, illness or like for, if you take medication or whatever, um, it just, the, it, the reality just is multiplied for people with eating disorders. Judy, yeah, I'm... and yes, go ahead. In regards to shame, you know, absolutely. When people are ashamed, what do they do? They hide. And, you know, part of being a part of a community is we don't want people to hide. We want people to reach out and be a part of the community. And if you are Muslim struggling with an eating disorder and, you know, your community is um, already making you feel more ashamed by putting that stigma upon you, you're not going to reach out. You'll back away from the religion and the community and fall deeper into your disorder. So in regards to shame, it's important that religious communities have open conversations about mental health and wellness and provide alternatives in the form of education and re-education to Muslims, new Muslims, Muslims who have been Muslim forever about the alternatives to fasting um, and really make it explicit that those are just as equal forms of observing Ramadan as fasting with food and water. I'm, right. I'm just I want, also, um, yeah, go ahead, Rania, go ahead. Thank you. I was, I was going to say on the topic of, of shame and stigma in the Muslim community, particularly around mental health issues. And yeah. I really want to have everybody really focus on the t idea that Ramadan is this month in the entire year that comes as very much a communal time. And because it's such a spiritual uh, month in which people really grow kind of together and spiritually, um, what, what it has helped solve is that sense of isolation. And particularly people that suffer from mental health uh, conditions often speak of the issue of isolation. So it's almost like a double whammy, really. If you're unable to fully partake into the community um, observations of Ramadan in all of its forms. And so I really um, echo exactly what Julia said about education. And I'm so glad to know that and, and, and know that the work that we're doing is allowing more education, what we call psychoeducation in the Muslim community, mm -hmm. particularly on issues of all mental health disorders, conditions, um, one of which is eating disorders. Rania, what do you think of this? I'm just going to show it to you right now. It's called The Mind of Mary, and it's an Instagram account, uh, and there are several, actually, very helpful ones. This is a message to Muslims with eating disorders, bipolar, depression, epilepsy, schizophrenia, OCD, etc. And then it talks about triggers and medication may, that may prevent you from fasting, but that doesn't make you any less of a Muslim. And then mm -hmm. it's talking about fighting your dragons, and your battles, you are strong, you are warriors. And there are lots of Instagram accounts like this, Ramadan Mubarak, and then this other one I found as well, Islam de dealing with disorders and talking about keeping calm and go see your doctor. How helpful Wonderful. can these be? I mean, it could be Wonderful. sometimes when you're on social, it can be a little bit triggering, or it can be incredibly helpful. Rani, I can see you chuckling there. Nadim, I see you chuckling. Rani, you go first. Sure. Um, the reason it really resonates, to be honest, for me, is because when I think of mental health conditions, I think about how incredibly unique each and every person is. And as a psychiatrist, I can tell you firsthand that no two people have the same condition. 
even if they're diagnosed with the same condition, which means that in the treatment plan, there has to be custom tailored approach to how to actually uh, treat that condition. So what that means in something like Ramadan and anything that relates to faith, we hope that if a person finds it useful, that they actually are seeking a combined treatment approach, which means that they're seeking a mental health professional along with a religious consultant, and that the two uh, fields are actually speaking to each other as well in trying to give the best care and support. And I can't emphasize that enough. If there's anything that I can you know, bring to this discussion is um, that custom tailored approach that has to happen uh, and how there has to be openness on both sides to really make the best uh, situation. Nazim, you enjoying those Instagram accounts. What, what help do you feel that you can add or advice or tips can you add for our viewers who may actually need some advice right now. Yeah, what I noticed is that uh, in one of the comments after the, um, the, 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 the loving uh, comment that was presented, it said how, you know, the medicine only makes you dependent on it. And I find that too many people practice medicine without a license and, and give advice. And so I would encourage you to go to professionals who can give you, uh, you know, the, um, the, the in Arabic we talk about nasiha, the, the proper advice, you know, because even the prophet, peace be upon him, will go to specialists to get advice, you know, on things, whether it was stratagems of, of war or dealing with how to grow dates. And, and so, um, so what we have to do is, is start to not just depend on our friends for, for the advice, but to get professionals for health-related matters. Mm -hmm. and, and that's one of the concerns I had. One of the books that I refer to my clients, it's a, uh, by a gentleman named John Bradshaw, and, it, and it's, it is titled Healing the Shame That Binds. And it's a very good uh, way of dealing with uh, toxic shame, which is paralyzing. But as, what we want to work on is not also developing a level of toxic religiosity. You know, and Islam promotes healthy spirituality and not toxic religiosity. Mm. Excellent advice there. I wanted to share some advice from uh, someone online who's dealing or was dealing with an eating disorder. Uh, Sam Kim says, I explained to my mom that I thought I had an eating disorder and we had to go to the, uh, the general practitioner who then referred me to a mental health service. I got assigned to an eating disorder nurse. And so the next year during Ramadan, we had an in-depth talk with her about whether or not we thought that I should fast. And so uh, that is the advice from one person. I wanted to play a video comment with advice from someone else. Um, this is Zahra Kaku. She's the director of the Muslim Youth Helpline out of the UK. And she talks about what it is they face there. Ramadan can be especially difficult if you have an eating disorder. One of the things that Muslims do a lot is communal eating. So we might have iftar with our family and friends pretty much every single day for 30 days. If you've got an eating disorder, that can be really difficult because it's public eating. So you might feel quite self-conscious or not want to eat or worry that people are judging you. It's become such an issue that at the helpline, we take calls about it pretty much every day. So Julie, she says she has calls pretty much every day, people calling in with this issue, and, and the website here is here on my laptop. You can see it, Muslim Youth Helpline. But for people who are out there thinking about calling, what would you tell them, Julie? Well, I would definitely say to reach out for help. You know, whoever it's from, whether it's from a hotline or your imam or from a support that you trust, because the first step in recovery is actually reaching out to somebody for that assistance and being open about what you're struggling through. You know, part of eating disorders is keeping secrets and there's a lot of shame in it. And when you are faced with these big family gatherings with a lot of food and a lot of conversation revolving around food, it can be extremely internally isolating while at the same time being very socially right. um, the opposite of that. Okay. Julie and Nadim and Safi and Rania, thank you so much for being part of this program. We really appreciate you bringing your insights to us during this beginning of the holy month of Ramadan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if any of the issues we've discussed today pertain to you or anyone you know, please reach out for help. In the U.S., the National Eating Disorders Association is available. And in the U.K., as I mentioned, the Muslim Youth Helpline may be able to help. We encourage you to find local resources. We'll see you next time.